The Research Institute for Preventative Health Care presents Dr. Bruce B. Miller in a continuing series on nutrition. These programs are designed to create nutritional awareness to aid in the understanding of health-related matters. Dr. Miller seeks to bring to you the latest scientific findings in the field of nutritional health care. Dr. Miller, noted author and internationally known lecturer, has spoken to thousands of people on the subject of nutrition and better health. Dr. Miller conducts numerous seminars on nutrition all over America, so he can share the knowledge gained from 30 years involvement with nutrition as an ongoing student, teacher, consultant, and researcher. In this program, Dr. Miller discusses beta-carotene, the amazing pro-vitamin that promotes and protects your health. Provocative new studies show that even beyond its many other benefits, beta-carotene may actually help protect against cancer. We'd like to welcome our video audience. What you're about to see is being filmed before a live audience, and we'd like to thank you for joining in. The tape we're going to do this morning is beta-carotene. Usually, you can help a person make a choice about a nutrient by answering three basic questions. And the three basic questions, I call them the, the three big nutrition questions, are number one, what does it do? Most people just want to know what it does. Well, beta-carotene may help you to prevent a number of pretty bad cancers. Now, to me, that's enough to say, hey, I'd like to get some of that stuff. Second question, and this is usually asked by a beady-eyed person. They always have little eyes sunk back in the back of their head, and they'll say, how do you know that? Well, they, they aren't sure about you. They, 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 they might be a relative, and relatives have a hard time, you know, uh, accepting you. These people, to me, always look sort of like this. This is, they say, how do you know that? So what I want to give you is a, a little information from, from various medical journals that will, that will tell us how we know that. And it's not just me saying it, but beta-carotene is, is sort of sweeping the world right now in the, in the literature so far as uh, being a cancer preventative. The next question, and we'll cover some of this because this is my interest, how does it do that? Wouldn't you agree if you can answer these three basic questions, what does it do, how do you know that, Journal of the American Medical Association, Lancet, whatever journal, and how does it do that, that you could convince a person that they might need to increase this nutrient in their diet? Would you agree? I would. <coughs> Probably the most terrifying words that I could ever hear, and perhaps you'll agree with this, are, Bruce, the results are positive. The test was positive. You have cancer. I just don't want to hear that. I would rather hear the IRS call this morning, and they're going to audit your, you from, from birth, um, or the 60 Minutes van just pulled up outside to film your life. You know, something like that. Anything but, Bruce, you have cancer. Some people look at, at cancer as, as, a, as a thunderbolt from out of the blue, just wham, strikes at random. And people develop the, the what's the use attitude. You know, if it's not the coffee, it's the stuff you put in the coffee, what's the use, everything causes cancer. You know, I, I can't do anything about it. 70% of cancer is preventable. And to me, prevention is the only route to take because this disease is expensive, it's potentially painful, it's, it's debilitating, costly to treat, and in 50% of the cases or more, it's fatal. You see, I want to skip step one. I don't want to get it and have the heroes come in and cure me. Do you? I just don't want to get it. I just want to quietly not do it. Cancer has been a, a medical failure for years. When the war on cancer was declared in 1971, that was the big deal. We said, we're going to get cancer. We thought it would be over very, very quickly. It only took us eight years to put a man on the moon. And since the war on cancer started in 1971, we have constantly been losing this battle. Listen to these statistics. It's projected that this year we'll have 910,000 new cases of cancer. That's up 30,000 from last year. 462,000 people will die. And all researchers, I'll say all credible researchers say, 70% of cancer is preventable by altering and modifying what we breathe, what we eat, and what we drink. It's that simple. 46% of all cancers are caused, or are lung cancer, colon cancer, or breast cancer. I hate that Virginia Slims ad that says, you've come a long way, baby. You're talking to you women. You have. You've, you've moved your breast cancer down to three. Your number one killer is now the same killer as we men have, lung cancer. 
women are pushed to smoke cigarettes. Th those ads bother me because they show this very attractive woman stretched out with this Virginia Slim in her hand. And the message to my daughter is, if you smoke Virginia Slims, you'll look like this lady. What they ought to show is somebody dying of lung cancer in a hospital in color. And maybe my daughters would choose not to smoke. I don't think so. What is cancer? How does it start? Cancer is a very complex disease. There, there are probably over 200 different diseases that we call, can, call cancer and some that overlap somewhat. In your lifetime, you probably get cancer about a thousand times. That make you feel nervous out there a little bit? If you have a good immune system, it takes care of it. If your immune system gets down or your cellular repair system gets down, then you're likely to be in some real trouble. It's believed that there's a so-called two-hit theory of causation in cancer. That's one of the latest ones going around. And it involves an initiator and a promoter. Let me show you how that works. Let's say you have a cell here, and the nucleus of the cell is right here. Inside the nucleus is the DNA. This contains all the hereditary knowledge of the cell. Let's blow this up a little bit. If you looked at it closely in a microscope, you'd have little threads like that. And to make it even bigger in our microscope, you'd see little threads, chromosomes like this. And the two-hit theory of cancer is this. You have an initiator that damages a piece of DNA. This doesn't cause cancer. You have to have a second step. A promoter has to come in and cause some damage. Once you have these two damages, you're set up for cancer. You can give an initiator all your life and you'll never cause cancer. The second thing has to happen, the second hit has to hit your DNA, the promoter. You can have a promoter in bathing your cells all your life, you'll never get cancer. Only till you get both of these at once are you set up for cancer. If your immune system is in good shape, you still won't get cancer even after you have a, a, the two hits. Also, if your DNA repair system is busy enough and healthy enough, it'll run around and repair or go around some of this damage, but that's also tied into the immune system. But the two hit theory is probably the most popular one around right now so far as cancer causation. The danger in cigarettes is that cigarettes are both contain both initiators and promoters. So you're hitting yourself twice when you're smoking cigarettes. Think about this, are cigarettes a food? No. Are they a drug? No. Cigarettes fell through the crack in the regulation. They aren't controlled by the FDA. We'll never know for sure what causes cancer in a cigarette because we'll never know what's in the cigarette. There are flavors and denicotinizers and detars and all that stuff and nobody knows how these things work and I don't think we ever will know. All cancers have one thing in common. They involve the production of abnormal cells that are capable of irregular, independent growth and they invade healthy body tissue. Now then, there are three types of cancers that are named from the tissue from which they're derived. You're getting real education. You ready for all this? It's almost like a pathology course. Carcinomas are number one. About 90% of our cancers are carcinomas. These come from epithelial tissue. These are the tissues that, that line all your body cavities and they uh, cover your body on the outside. They line and cover. You might think of those. But these include, carcinomas include, lung, breast, and bowel cancer. In other words, most of the cancers are carcinomas. This is also where beta carotene does its work. Sarcomas occur in the slow dividing cells of our body, like nerve cells, muscle cells, and such as that. I haven't read many reports on uh, beta carotene working with sarcomas or leukemias, um, one or two, because of, the, of what beta carotene does with the immune system. Leukemias are those that happen within the blood cells. But the, like I say, the three top killers are all carcinomas. Now then, cancers are also named from the part of, of the body that they come from. You can have lung cancer, bladder cancer, and so on. And to complicate this even more, there are other types of lung cancer. We call them all lung cancers. Um, you can have small cell lung cancer, large cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma of the lung, uh, bronchiogenic carcinoma of the lung, and so on. We call them all lung cancers. I went through this complicated stuff to give you a little education on it, but also to show you that it is a complicated disease. 
I'll get a call sometime and someone will say, Bruce, uh, I've got cancer, what should I do? Well, my gosh, I, I, don't, have, I don't have any idea. What kind do you have? Uh, it's the kind that kills you. Well, I, I got to get ready to go on out then. I don't know. There, there, there are too many factors involved to give snap decisions on, on cancer. But like I say, lung cancer is the number one killer. The good news is this is where all the evidence that shows that beta carotene does this, it's the best work. I feel we should supplement our diet with beta carotene because our tastes have changed so much or our tastes have been changed by the industry. Television, principally. You know, we, we've, we've completely changed our taste since about the 1900s. Uh, maybe you can, maybe, uh, let's play a game. Let's see if you can finish up uh, the commercial I'm gonna give you. You ready? Things go better with Coke. Now, how'd you know that? You were pounded with it. If things go better with Coke, that means if my little redheaded daughter, who's weird, has a bad day, she can come home and knock back a six pack and feel better. Things will go better. Of course, she might get diabetes or her teeth might fall out. Double your pleasure, double your fun with double mint chewing gum. So if you want to double your fun today, get your mouth full of gum and start chewing on it. Have a blank and a smile. Coke, you got it. Blank tastes good like a cigarette should. Winston, isn't that amazing? We are totally brainwashed by the advertising industry. Have you ever noticed if someone asks you what's for dinner or what's for lunch, you always name the meat dish? Isn't that interesting? What's for lunch? Roast. What's for lunch? Steak. They ask around my house, what's for lunch? You stir fry vegetables. And what? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> Back in the 1900s, most of our diet came from fresh foods, fresh fruits, vegetables, and grain. The only canned food was home canned. I used to love to watch my mother can it smell good, and then I just loved to watch her do it. Making jelly was fun. We used to get Mustang grapes in South Texas, and her hands had turned purple when she was squeezing the grape juice out. That was fun to watch my mother with purple hands. Today, over 80% of our diets are processed in some way, and every step of processing reduces the nutrient value of your, of your diet. In the early days, we ate for energy, for nutrition. Today, we eat for pleasure, for recreation. We're always looking for the new taste treat, listening to the commercials, uh, Twinkies and Bonkers and all these things that are constantly being thrown at us. As a rule, our diets don't contain a large volume of those vegetables that contain a lot of beta carotene. Here they are. Squash, carrots, spinach, red cabbage, turnip greens, collards, all number one on, on the list of the kids' favorite foods, right? I mean, my, my kids just always want collards. So. <laughs> Go to your local fast food store and ask for a Mac Collard and see what you get. <laughs> There's almost nothing in any of the fast, fast food places that uh, offer any beta carotene whatsoever. And it's difficult to get people to go back to eating greens and collards and red cabbage and this sort of thing. I just don't think we are. Let me give you some discussion from the National Cancer Institute. By the way, NCI has been against nutrition as a, as a use in cancer prevention since its inception almost. They received over 325 papers since 1981, good, solid, valid papers supporting the fact that beta carotene can be of a great aid in a number of cancers. Dr. Michael Sporn, National Cancer Institute, proposes that vitamin A and substances chemically related to vitamin A, such as beta carotene, can make important contributions to, get this, the prevention of cancer. More than half of all human cancer starts in epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue forms a lining of organs and glands such as mammary glands, skin, passages of the body, lungs, gut, bladder, reproductive organs, all are lined with epithelial tissue. Those are carcinomas, remember? 90% of our cancers are in those tissues I just named. They're all lined with epithelium. That's where the carcinomas come from. Epithelial tissue depends on vitamin A or beta carotene for its normal development. Without significant vitamin A, these cells often undergo precancerous changes. And we'll talk about cell differentiation in just a few minutes. Laboratory studies demonstrate that animals deficient in vitamin A or beta carotene have increased vulnerability to cancer-causing chemicals. And when I think about our toxic environment and what, how we breathe and what we drink and what we eat, 
I want something that will protect me against cancer-causing chemicals. National Cancer Institute is saying beta-carotene or vitamin A will do it. Vitamin A protects animals given such chemicals from stomach, lung, respiratory, and uterine cancer. A recent study of over 8,000 Norwegian men demonstrated a diet adequate in vitamin A significantly reduces a smoker's chances of developing lung cancer. Further, vitamin A and some closely related substances can actually reverse precancerous changes. And those closely related substances have to do with beta-carotene. Let's get into beta-carotene just a little bit. We need to get some terminology straight. Let me show you what it looks like in a, a pictorial form. Beta-carotene is actually two molecules of vitamin A joined together. We have a molecule of vitamin A, a molecule of vitamin A, and there's a little bridge that joins them together. On demand, and only on demand, when your body does need vitamin A, a little enzyme splits this and produces two molecules of vitamin A for your body. Vitamin A by itself does some things, but beta-carotene as a separate molecule seems to be the one that has the best effect on the body. When we talk about how it works, I'll show you uh, how A and uh, beta-carotene can both have an effect. For the chemistry buffs, let's do this in, in chemical form. This is always exciting. I'm sure you're going to take notes and draw pictures of this. This is vitamin A. Isn't that exciting? This is beta-carotene. Wonderful. Bruce, you're just, I'm, the front row just passed out. They got so excited seeing all that. This is where the enzyme splits the molecule. This is kind of a flip over here and gives you two molecules of vitamin A. You can see from this drawing, of course you can see from that drawing, the optical difference in the vitamin A's. I I'm, I'm, hope that satisfied everybody who's in, totally into chemistry. Uh, most people kind of fall asleep on that part. Treatment figures are very grim on, on lung cancer. To me, it makes prevention the only way to go. Listen to these treatment figures. Early diagnosis, the five-year survival rate is 33%. And cancer is very difficult to diagnose early, lung cancer, that is. In cases where it's already spread to other areas of the body, it's already metastasized, the five-year survival rate is less than 1%. The overall survival rate is 8% for five years. And this figure has not changed much in the last 15 years. Things have not changed. You know what's interesting to me is that as beta-carotene has dropped from our diet, lung cancer has increased. In fact, if you'd make a chart, lung cancer has been increasing slowly and steadily over the years. Cigarette smoking has been going down pretty rapidly, hasn't it? But also, beta-carotene in our diet has been going down. I see a correlation between the loss of beta-carotene in our diet and the fact that lung cancer has stayed on a pretty steady increase. I think smoking is involved. I agree with that. But I also believe that the loss of beta-carotene in our diet plays a pretty large role. When someone's smoking around me, I say, don't blow smoke in my face, I'd rather die a natural death. Because that's the way I feel about it. There have been several large, competent, complete studies on beta-carotene. And see, the larger the study, the more the statistical power of the study. And so we like to see large studies. A Japanese study of 240,000 people, we'll talk about some this morning, the Norwegian study I referred to of 8,000 people, 14,000 in England, 3,000 in Georgia, uh, 1,900 in the Western Electric study in Chicago, every one of them supporting the fact of the protective powers of beta-carotene. The bottom line is that beta-carotene greatly reduces the incidence of lung cancer in smokers. And then for those of us who don't smoke or have stopped smoking, to me, prevention would be phenomenal. The benchmark study on uh, smoking and beta-carotene and vitamin A was done by, by Dr. Shekel in Chicago. It's called the Western Electric Study. And like I said, numbers, big numbers, make a study valid. Uh, the length of the study is also important. This study went on for 19 years, and it's still going on. You know, sometimes you read a study, a study of two people that lasted a week, you don't put a lot of validity in that. Also, who did the study? What were the controls involved? The Western Electric study is a very, very well-recognized study as being totally valid. 
Uh, Dr. Shakel followed these uh, actually 1,954 middle-aged men for 19 years and was able to show a below average intake of beta carotene preceded the development of cancer. Just cut and dried. At a press conference, Dr. Shakel said this, we were able to show, particularly among men who had smoked cigarettes for a number of years, that men with low levels of beta carotene had higher risk than the ones with high levels of beta carotene who had never smoked. You know, it's amazing to me, if you, here were smokers with high levels of beta carotene, they had about the same lung cancer risk as someone who had never smoked but had a low level of beta carotene. To me, it's just phenomenal. Um, during this time, some of these smokers did develop cancer. They had one group of 448 men, all smokers in each group, low in beta carotene, who were smokers, 14 developed lung cancer. Smokers, high in beta carotene, only two developed cancer. You know, that to, and this level, by the way, this is just about equal to those who didn't smoke but were low in beta carotene. Then he made another comment that gives us a hint of how beta carotene might work in the body. He said this, dietary vitamin A itself did not appear to prevent lung cancer. Perhaps cigarette smoke in the lungs immediately destroys vitamin A, whereas beta carotene is converted to vitamin A over a period of time and so constantly replenishes vitamin A in the lungs. See, most of your vitamin A is either in your liver, your thymus, or your eyeballs, for most of it is. Beta carotene is all over your body and all the fatty tissue. And let's just say your lungs are being bombarded by all these bad toxins and things and vitamin A is getting picked off right and left and the lungs run out of it and they, they uh, break our one nine for vitamin A control and that's in the liver. And they'll say, we need some A over here in the lungs. And they say, we'll send it overnight, overnight. And they will need it right now. And then it gets lost in the mail somewhere in the body down here in the spleen. Anyway, things happen like that in the body. Beta carotene is constantly there, constantly splitting this little molecule to vitamin A. The lungs, I need some vitamin A. Beta carotene says, here it is, bloop, splits and gives two molecules. I think that's one way it works. Beta carotene itself constantly furnishing vitamin A to the lungs to protect them. Anyway, with all these studies, there was finally an, an effect. I call it the trickle-down effect sometime in research. National Cancer Institute got together with Harvard Medical School and decided to do one of the biggest studies that's ever been done on beta carotene. And the most, I'll say it'll probably be the truest study because for experimental animals, they're using physicians. They had an aspirin study going at Harvard, and Harvard was going to check out the results of aspirin possibly on a heart attack. And so they brought in the physicians also as, as guinea pigs, and they were going to use, decide to use beta carotene. Uh, they, they contacted 200,000 physicians. Right now, 26,000 physicians, all males, between ages of 45 and 75, had volunteered. They're taking 25,000 IU of beta carotene every other day. So they're taking about 75,000 IU a week. It'll give you an idea of about how much to supplement your diet. I'm excited about that because this is the first time that NCI or Harvard have ever sponsored a food supplement study. Does it have any effect? And from the research that I'm going to show you, you're going to know it has effect. I think the people at NCI knows it has an effect. I think they have to just convince the physicians it has an effect. And I think when this study comes out, probably in two years it'll be published, I believe the ramifications for the food supplement people are going to be phenomenal. But if they see one that works, I think they're going to say, hey, what else will work? And they'll begin to see other things on the market that will do so well. Let me show you an interesting study from Albert Einstein Medical College. This is a, an animal study. And uh, some of this I heard in meetings, some of it I've read in some publishing. They used ugly mice for this, bald-headed mice. Have you ever seen a naked mouse with no hair on his little body? They're ugly. They don't deserve to live. Don't worry about them being sacrificed for experiment. But we have to shave them otherwise. You ever try to shave a mouse, get his little leg, ting, 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 ting? Can you make it go like that? They're great for research. You don't have to shave them. These are inbred mice, so you can rule out genetics. And this is great because in research, we're always worried about genetics being involved. And so you totally rule it out. And they don't have any hair, which makes them gross. Have you ever seen a mouse when it's born? They're pink and naked. Imagine a gray one slinking around his cage with no hair. They're a strange looking creature. Uh, they're handy to have with no hair because they inoculate their back leg usually with cancer cells. 
And if you take this strain of mice and inoculate these, these mice with cancer, 50% of them will develop a cancer. It will take. That's a standard index. When you get 50% of them with cancer, that's standard. Get this. When they give them beta carotene, only 10% of them get cancer. That's taking a live culture of cancer and planting it on their leg, and with beta carotene, only 10% get cancer. They did another thing. They put some on radiation, some on no treatment, and some on radiation with beta carotene. And here are the results. No treatment, they live 41 days. Radiation only, they live 83 days. Radiation and beta carotene, all but one was still alive at the end of the year. I think this one died of a heart attack finding out he was still alive, but everybody else dying right and left. He goes, oh, I'm still alive and died. I show you this, this one because uh, people say, well, what would you do if you got cancer, Bruce? What's, if they said the biopsy is positive, you've got cancer, what would you do? Well, I'd, I'd go for conventional treatment, but I would also take my beta carotene. This, this shows it. You know, Bruce, you're going to have to have radiation therapy. Well, if I have radiation only and I'm a mouse, I'm going to live 83 days. But if I have radiation and beta carotene, according to this, this study, I, I'll, I'll live 365 days unless I have a heart attack and shock that I'm still alive. He didn't die of a heart attack. He actually redeveloped his tumor. Let me give you the comment on that. It's very interesting. Researchers said this, the tumors got smaller to the point where you couldn't feel them anymore. Only one animal regrew the tumor and died. They all lived out the first year. Then they took these poor little rascals again, these survivors, and did another thing on them. They took some off of beta carotene and left some on beta carotene. On beta carotene, 100% survival. When they took them off beta carotene, 17% survival. You see, I don't know what's going on inside my lungs. I have no idea. I can't crawl in there and look. I don't want to cut it open and look because everything will fall out. It's a mess to put it all back in. You don't want to do that. <laughs> so I see these that stayed on beta carotene had a, you know, a fantastic survival rate. These that they took off the beta carotene redeveloped their tumor <clears throat> and died. And so, like I say, I don't know. So I keep beta carotene relatively high, supplementing my diet. They weren't through with these poor little rascals yet. They did another thing. They were curious as to whether the same group, same survivors, they had some on vitamin A and some on beta carotene, and they were curious as to, as to whether vitamin A was doing the job or beta carotene was doing the job, and which, which was doing a better job. So they took them off of vitamin A and took them off of beta carotene. On, vitamin, on uh, vitamin A, 61 days they died. When they took them off beta carotene, they lived 204 days, but that was the normal lifespan of an ugly naked mouse, 204 days. In fact, here was a comment, even after developing a lethal cancer twice, they managed to survive 654 days, the natural lifespan of a mouse with a good quality of life. What's a good quality of life for a naked mouse? Does anybody know? I mean, they have little Hondas they ride around on, they go to little parties and things, I don't know. I don't know how you study the quality of life of a mouse, I have no idea. Would, would beta carotene be of any effect, uh, say, for chemotherapy? This is a study from uh, Wisconsin Cancer Center in, in Madison. They had 37 women scheduled for chemotherapy, and they did study on their vitamin A levels. And here are the results. Low in vitamin A, 36% improved. High in vitamin A, 83% improved. Low in vitamin A, 40% got worse. High in vitamin A, 0% got worse. So suppose my beautiful wife were diagnosed with, uh, this happened to be a breast cancer study, with breast cancer. What would I do? I would say, Jody, we're going for conventional therapy, but you're going to have a nice tan when you go in. I'd give her quite a bit of beta carotene to go in because these studies show that if you're high in those levels, even if you're undergoing conventional therapy, that you seem to get better results. One of the largest studies uh, was that Norwegian study I've alluded to once or twice, 8,000 Norwegians. Those with the least amount of beta carotene had twice the chance of getting lung cancer as those who had more beta carotene. Twice the chance. We do know if you take vitamin A long enough and enough of it, it can be toxic. 
about 50,000 IU, uh, you know, hit some people, you have to do that 50,000 IU for about a year. Uh, if you eat just carrots or beta carotene, this doesn't bother you because beta carotene itself is not toxic. They found this out in, I think it was, the one study I read was in Berkeley, California, back during the hippie era. A number of hippies got together and had the divine inspiration that if you ate enough carrots, you'd go to Nirvana or somewhere. You'd have a vision or something. I'm not quite sure what all that was. But anyway, they were eating about a bushel of carrots a day. And their skin started turning yellow, and the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet turned sort of an orange-yellow. And of course, they went to the health center, and I'm sure that impressed the physicians all to heck. And they weren't in Nirvana, they were just yellow. And they call this keratinosis. In other words, beta-carotene depositing in the fat tissues will give you sort of an orangey-yellow color if you get enough of it. I've tried to do that, and I can't do it. I was taking enough beta-carotene, eating carrots this last summer. I wanted to see how I looked with that kind of tan. I never got there. So it varies for different people, but you'd have to take an awful lot of it. But the main thing is it's not particularly toxic. The studies I've shown and talked to you about have been with established cancers, cancers that are being treated. If it works so well in such extreme situations, someone with cancer under radiation or chemotherapy, taking beta carotene, seeming to get better results, to me it takes no great, great leap in logic to say it would work quite well in prevention. Do you think so? If it works that well. Let me just give you some more studies because do, people do ask, how do you know that? You know, so many times. I want to show you these, partly for the content of the study, but mostly, look at the journal listings. Look where this stuff comes from. The huge Japanese study I talked about. 240,000 people. You know, I love the Japanese because they're so orderly and so neat. Uh, Jody and I were in uh, Hawaii not long ago, and we were going to go to Maui. And the plane was full of Japanese honeymooners. They were all going to get on. We were the only ones who were round-eyed and not on our honeymoon. The, they were holding the plane down so it wouldn't take off on hormones all by itself. Let's go. But we were in the terminal waiting to go out this little door to get on the plane, and the, and the last speaker said, everybody, please line up over here. And all the ugly little Japanese went over there and lined up. The ugly Americans up there saying, why, 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 why do you want us over there? I was the only one. If you sent, they sent this out to 270,000 people, 240,000 responded. If you sent this out to 270,000 Americans, you know, a health thing to fill out, you'd get 10 responses probably. But anyway. This is what happened, reduction in lung cancer from dietary aspects of carcinogenesis. A study at Harvard, community health studies. Very, very good uh, periodicals. These aren't lightweight journals we're discussing. A couple more, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, having past spears low in beta carotene, three times the risk of cervical cancer. Nutrition and cancer, very, very good journal. Study of 190 with cancer and without. Those higher in beta carotene had a reduced risk of cancer. International Journal of Cancer. Now, this is not appearing in some pulp health magazine that you might pick up at the drugstore. These are solid, well-recognized, well-researched studies by recognized people. Then the question comes, um, do we get enough beta carotene and vitamin A in the standard American diet, which I call the SAD, standard American diet. You can figure that out why. Government studies tell us that we do not get adequate vitamin A in our diets. Haines study, H-A-N-E-S, this is the Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, probably one of the best studies ever done on populations. It was done by the Department of Health and Education and Welfare. Shows 3,500 IU a day as their standard to research with. Here's what they found out. 50% of the men and 60% of the women ate levels below that. If you take this to the RDA, which is for men 5,000 and women 4,000, 60% of both men and women get a vitamin A or beta carotene intake below that of which we should. You see why I think there's a correlation between the increase in lung cancer and the decrease in beta carotene in our diet? These figures have been just steadily decreasing. Let me give you a few highlights on those studies. There was one interesting, on the Japanese study, 240,000 people, you're only one half as likely to develop or die from cancer of any form in that study. So that might hit the sarcomas and leukemias, probably has to do with the immune system. This is one I like on the study in Georgia of 3,000 people and of 13,000 in England, low vitamin A levels were associated with cancer. High vitamin A levels reduce the risk of cancer independent of age. 
That's important. So many times you hear this, if you live long enough, you'll get it. And this day they said, independent of age, high beta carotene levels seem to protect you. And how does it work? Four, four ways come up in the literature, and I'm gonna go through them individually. I wanna list them first. As an antioxidant, tissue development theory, the immune system theory, and skin defense theory. I call these all theories because they've never been totally proven. We do know it works. Now, how does it work? I think it's a combination of all these. And as, a, as I develop them, I'll show you why. Antioxidants, or oxidants themselves, are difficult to explain because they're, they're very, very uh, complex chemical molecules. Think of an oxidant particle or a free radical loose in your body like a, about a 50-pound bowling ball loose in a china shop going about 60 miles an hour. And splat, you know, something's gonna happen. It's gonna cause some damage. There's a very dangerous free radical called singlet oxygen. Beta carotene will destroy singlet oxygen. Vitamin E will destroy singlet oxygen. But it is destroyed when it hits, when, when the singlet oxygen hits it. Beta carotene is not destroyed. Vitamin A will work somewhat against singlet oxygen. It's destroyed when it destroys singlet oxygen. Beta carotene is not destroyed. Uh, a singlet oxygen is like about a 500 pound bowling ball loose in a china shop. It will cause cell damage. Let me show you how it looks. Free radical comes zooming in toward the cell, hits it, it goes splat. That's the medical term you're gonna be hearing a lot about, splat. <laughs> Beta carotene erects sort of a, a force field out in front of this free radical, and when it hits, it goes splut. That's another term that'll probably be in Dorland's medical dictionary pretty soon. Let me bring uh, an antioxidant down to a little bit closer to us. Think of oxidation as rust. That's what it is. It's cellular rust. When something, a piece of metal rusts, it oxidizes. Think of your cell as being a, a fantastically complex machine made of bright, shiny parts and chrome and everything. It's moving at a high rate of speed with close rates of tolerances. If you begin to develop rust on that, what's gonna happen? It's gonna begin to freeze up and squeak and not run so well, right? And finally shut down. That's what oxidants do, in essence, to your cell. They cause damage and cause the cell not to work so well. The antioxidant nutrients are vitamin A, beta carotene, uh, C, E, and selenium. Those are the ones that protect you against the oxidants. The next one is the tissue development theory. And I want to take you inside the bronchial tube to show you what the tissue development theory looks like. Here's a cross section of the bronchial tube. And you have two types of cells in there. You either have mucous cells or cilia cells. The mucous cells secre secrete mucus along the lining. And there's actually a, kind of a river of mucus on these cells and the cilia are little hair-like particles that constantly sweep the current of the river up toward the back of your throat. So if you have dust and other particles on this mucus level, it's always going to the back of your throat. When it gets there, what you do with it depends on how you were raised. And that's up to you what you want to do with it. I, I don't want to get into how you were raised, and I know what Texans do with it, and it's kind of gross. But this is always moving up on this huge mucus wave, a very, very excellent protective device because the mucus is a barrier for cancerous substances, bacteria, viruses, and other things getting to these cells. Now then, pre-cells are formed in the basement membrane and they are not differentiated. They, are, they haven't changed into either a mucus cell or a cilia cell. They're supposed to become one of the two. Vitamin A directs the development of this cell. Beta carotene will too. It needs to be directed in the way it's gonna go. Without vitamin A, let me show you what can happen. And this is, I think, extremely prevalent in our lives today. I made the slide a little larger. Here's our basement membrane, and here's a pre-cell. Let's say that this tissue is deficient in vitamin A. As that cell grows, it doesn't become either mucous cell or cilia cell. It kinda does its own thing. It forms kind of a whitish, very dry, scaly looking little cell. It keeps on growing and finally it reaches the top. And if you see this in the mouth, it's called leukoplakia, or white spot, or white patch. And since you see them in the mouth, the throat, they go all the way down. These are precancerous. 
that they list it as a precancerous area. And the interesting thing is, if this person starts taking beta carotene, these will go away. And when I read that first thing by Dr. Sporn, I believe this is what he was talking about, will actually reverse some precancerous changes. The next is the immune system. The immune system, probably one of the most important systems in your body. Here's a, this is a bone. You recognize that as a bone? I don't know which bone it is, but that's a bone. Most of the cells in your immune system begin in the bone, and they go through a little gland, some cells go through a little gland in the middle of your breastbone called the thymus gland. And when they come through there, they become T cells. And T cells are one of the most important cells in your immune system. Where does vitamin A, beta carotene fit into all this? One area where you have a tremendous concentration of vitamin A is in the thymus. Next to the liver and the eyes, you have more vitamin A and beta carotene in your thymus gland than anywhere else in your body. We do know this, when your body's under attack by cancer and, uh, or any bacterial infection, that the levels of vitamin A and beta carotene in your thymus drop. We aren't quite sure how they're being used up, but we are sure they're being used up. So how does it work? I think in all those areas, wouldn't you agree? It probably helps the immune system. It helps, you know, knock down all these uh, things that pop up in our systems. It helps the skin defense system. By the way, I didn't mention that, that strong enough. You are covered with skin. The largest organ in your body is skin. Everything is lined with skin. Uh, your back, your arm is swarming with bacteria right now. that make you itch all over. It kind of worries you, doesn't it? it? It cannot invade unless you get a cut or an opening somewhere in your skin. That's the first defense mechanism. And so I think all these work together. Vitamin A maintains your skin. It's, it's responsible for your skin cells to differentiate properly. It's in the immune system, and it's a strong antioxidant. So I think it works in all four of these areas and does tremendous things for us. You know, there are no guarantees in life, are there? You know, I can't guarantee that if you increase beta carotene in your diet that you aren't going to get some form of cancer. That would be a totally misleading statement. So don't get me wrong. I'm not touting this as some panacea. But I think based on the available evidence, the things that I've shown you on the overhead and the things that I've said, I can safely say that if you will increase beta carotene in your diet, you can dramatically reduce your chances of getting some pretty deadly cancers. Not all. But wouldn't you agree from the evidence that that's true? Personally, I'm gonna choose a two-pronged attack. Number one, I am gonna increase beta-carotene rich vegetables in my diet. But you know, like I say, if I'm on an airplane, I don't do well. Sometime I'm in a hurry at noon, and I, I just eat whatever's available. And there's not a lot of beta-carotene in the things that are usually available. You know, I, I like a Mac Collard, please. You remember that? You don't get Mac Collard. I would always eat well. I try to, but I don't. The second prong of my attack is this. I'm going to take a beta-carotene food supplement to add insurance to what my diet doesn't supply. You can't overdose on beta-carotene. We're always worried about ODing on this and that. I overdose on tacos every now and then, but that's beside the point, I guess. The next great advance in medical science is not going to come from the laboratory or from the test tube. The next great advance in medical science is going to come when each one of us realizes that we are responsible for our own health. Nobody else is. I wish you all long health. Thank you very much. For more information about Dr. Miller's books, videos, nutritional materials, and seminars, please write Bruce Miller Enterprises Incorporated, P.O. Box, 50296 Fort Worth, Texas 76105 or call 817-536-8248.